Uh, children 12 and under are dismissed to go to the other building and their teachers. While I get my podium. Good morning. Good morning. Does anybody else think we need the fans on, or is that just me? Yes. yes. Okay, if you think we need the fans on, put your hand up. All right, those of you that are cold, get a blanket. I'll turn them low so you don't get too cold. So I've got a couple of things that I want to address today. Uh, we are in the midst of a series on the fruit of God's Spirit, the fruit exhibited in a life led by God's Spirit. Um, and we're actually, we're in the midst of patience. And you guys are going to have to exhibit patience because I'm not going to deal with that today. <laughs> okay? Um, because of, of the, the Sunday that it is, there's a couple of things that I want to address. Now, the first thing, I just want to want to clear the record. Will the real Santa Claus please stand up? Okay? Because we have this incredibly shallow idea of who Santa Claus is, and it's, it's a horribly misconstrued idea from who he was. Okay? We have this idea of this omniscient, jolly fat man with a benevolent heart and really, really fast reindeer. <laughs> and, and we have this just weird, twisted idea. And I, I want to give you some historical information about Santa Claus, <coughs> okay? Because Santa Claus is actually Saint Nicholas, okay? In German, it's Santa Claus. Santa, and, and we get Santa Claus from St. Nicholas. Now, St. Nicholas was an historical figure. Okay? He was a real person. Okay? Um, he was born um, late 200s. He was born in Patara, which is a city on the southern coast of Turkey, modern-day Turkey. He was born to wealthy parents. Christian parents who died in an epidemic. He was then raised by his uncle, who was the Bishop of Patara, who was also named Nicholas. Um, there are a couple of things that Nicholas was known for. One was his generosity. Now, there are a lot of stories out there about things that he did, but one of them that we know to be fairly accurate, in general, if not in detail, is that there was a certain man in the city that St. Nicholas lived, who had three daughters. And he could not afford a dowry for his three daughters, which meant when he died, his daughters would most likely have to turn to some form of living that would compromise their Christian faith because they couldn't afford a husband. Now, you guys figure that one. <laughs> All right? Different time, different culture. Um... Now, there are several different versions of the story. The upshot of it is, is that St. Nicholas found out about this. And over the course of a period of time, took coins in a bag and gave them to the father anonymously. Some say that he threw them in the window. Some say that he left them in a boot on the front door, on the step. Some say that at one point he actually dropped one down a chimney and it landed in the girl's stocking that she put over the fire to, to dry her stocking. 
doesn't matter. That really, the details don't matter. The idea is that this man was incredibly generous. Okay? But that's not what really the historical St. Nicholas is known for. Okay? What he is known for, he was um, the Bishop of Myra. That's a town uh, in the northern part of modern day Turkey. And he was actually imprisoned and persecuted under the Diocletian persecution. Okay? Now, for those of you that know a little bit about church history, the Diocletian persecution is considered the second great persecution of Christians. Okay? It made Nero look like a pansy. It was horrible, the things that were inflicted on Christians because of their faith. He was imprisoned. He was set free. He was at the Council of Nicaea. This was uh, up where uh, modern-day Russia joins Turkey, up by the Black Sea. Um, and this council was brought together for one specific purpose. Does anyone know what the Council of Nicaea determined? Now we got our Bible. Nope. The Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed basically addressed what we know today as the um, Arian heresy. Not Arian like the master race. Arian as in from Arius, okay? And Arius was a minister who was convinced that Jesus was not God. He was a man. And that he did not live eternally, but he was created at the moment of conception and then was blessed of God and became something somewhat more than a man, but not quite God, okay? And at the Council of Nicaea, this was a raging topic. Was he just a man, or was he God incarnate? And when Arius was giving his speech and, and proclaiming his beliefs that, that Jesus was just a man, Nicholas was so incensed, he was so insulted at the blasphemy be, being done to his Lord and Savior that he actually walked around the table and struck Arius in the face. Okay? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Get this? This is the Santa Claus we're talking about. He walloped the dude. Okay? That is what St. Nicholas is known for. For his staunch defense of his Savior. Okay? So when you're, you know, walking around and you see these guys in red suits with weird hats and, and Santa Claus, you know, that is a horrible horrible disservice to a man who gave his everything for Jesus Christ. And if he were to see how he was being portrayed today, he would be horribly offended. I think there'd be a lot of people getting slapped. <laughs> okay? So, but, but the thing I want to point to you, I, I don't want to point you to St. Nicholas. I want to point you to who he pointed to. Because see, that's what's so unique, what, what impressed me about him is his life was all about pointing people to Christ and who Christ was. So flip open with me if you would. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to start in verse 2. So we're in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when the divide that when they divide the spoil, for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressors, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel in the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, 
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now there's a lot in this passage, but I'm going to deal with just verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And actually, I'm going to make it even easier on you, because I'm not even going to deal with the whole passage. I'm just going to deal with the titles ascribed to Jesus. Now, the first thing that I noticed when I went through and I, I looked at this passage was a, a kind of a, a grammatical misunderstanding that I've always had. Wonderful counselor. What would wonderful be in that phrase? Adjective. 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 Why? Because it's describing what? <laughs> counselor, which is what? Wonderful. Well, I mean, what, what is that as, as far as grammar? No. Okay, but did you know in the Hebrew that's completely backwards? Did you know in the Hebrew wonderful is actually the noun? And that counselor is a verb? Did, did you know that? I was shocked. Because, see, the emphasis is not on the fact that he's the counselor. The emphasis is on the fact that he's wonderful. So, wonderful. In the Hebrew, this word means to separate. Well, how do we get wonderful out of to separate? Well, well, we'll get into that because it's an interpretation of this word. To separate. You guys remember what holy means? Separate. Set apart. Okay? Unique. That's where this word is coming from. It also means to distinguish. It means great. Wonderful. It means something that is difficult to accomplish. Now, think about that for a minute in light of this scripture. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Separate, unique, great. Something that is difficult to accomplish. This is all wrapped up in who Jesus is and everything that he was going to do. See, this is why God did not choose English to write his word in. Because we look at wonderful and, and think something... Uh, what do you think when you think the word wonderful? Especially in light of Christmas. I don't know about you, but I think of giant candy canes at the mall. <laughs> I think of snow, winter wonderland. Okay? But but that that doesn't that idea is not idea is not carried through here, is it? This is this is someone that God is sent, sending to accomplish something that is difficult to accomplish. Somebody great. Wonderful counselor. Well, okay. Counselor to advise, deliberate or resolve to consult or counsel. But, but the idea is this, this is describing what the noun is doing. So the person that is wonderful will be giving counsel. What kind of counsel was Jesus giving us? Well, well let's back up a, verse, a couple of verses. It says, um, Those who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Well, what does John say about the great light? John chapter 1. Jesus is the light. And he came into the world, and the world didn't recognize him. But the, the darkness withstood him, but the darkness has not overcome him. Think about that for a minute. Now, think about that in light of the counsel of the life of Jesus. What was the entire life of Jesus about? Well, I mean, ultimately, it was pointed to the cross. But the cross was just the means whereby our 
relationship with God could be reconciled. We could be made right before God, the offended party, right? He's the one that was offended. God has done nothing to offend us. We did something, lots of some things, to offend him, okay? So his entire message is about returning, being restored, being reconciled. But that's not all he did. Because, see, there's, there's something else that Jesus did by his very life that I think is incredible if we can really grasp this. Because everything that he describes here, listen to what he's saying. He's wonderful counselor. He's mighty God. He's everlasting Father. He's Prince of Peace. What, what does this sound like is being described here? Does this sound like he's describing a man? Who is he describing? God. He is describing the very person of God. But how do we reconcile that with, for to us a child is born. A son is given. This is, this is where Nicholas was like, Arius, you got it wrong, buddy. Because something miraculous happened. Would you go ahead and put the picture back up there, Josh? Something miraculous happened in that stable, in the manger. A baby, a man-child, having the very nature of God, was born. The incarnation, the hypostatic union. Remember? He was fully God, fully man. Now, I'm going to jump back for just a second. I want to read to you something that the Nicene Creed, a creed is just a, a simple set of beliefs, okay? They write them out so everybody can understand them. There's one passage I want to read to you from this creed. <clears throat> this is what they determined concerning Jesus. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made being of one substance with the Father. You get that? Being of one substance with the Father. See that baby right there? That's not the baby, that's, that's just an artist's interpretation. Um, I don't think they looked anything like that. You know why? Well, because he was Jewish, he didn't trim his beard. Should have been big and bushy. I think that's just a very westernized picture of what really happened there. Quite honestly, I don't think he was born in a stable the way that we picture stables. But we'll talk about that later. Um, but that baby that was born on that morning was the very essence of God. Do you understand that? The very essence of God. So, wonderful counselor. There's a couple of passages for you to look up when you have time. Psalm 16, 7, Romans 11, 34. Don't, don't go there now. I'm just going to read them to you real quick. It says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. Hmm. For who has known the mind of the Lord... Or who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? See, God gives us counsel. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was getting ready to leave, what did he say? He said, it's better for you that I leave. Why? Why, Why is this a good thing? I mean, you died for our sins, you rose from the dead, you walked through walls. 
You provide food whenever we're hungry. You give us godly counsel. You point us in the right direction. Why is it good for us that you're leaving? Well, what did he say? Because the Holy Spirit. Yeah. He said, I'm going to send my spirit. The Spirit of God. To teach you. Now, this is really a cool thing because think about this for a minute. When Jesus died, what happened in the temple? The curtain. The curtain was torn. From top to bottom, the curtain was rent, torn open. And what was in the Holy of Holies was exposed. And then in the upper room, the day of Pentecost, what happened? The Holy Spirit was given to men. Now that's the first big whammy. And then we see a little bit later at Caesarea. It was given again, but this time it was given not just to Jews, it was given to Gentiles. And, and everybody kind of got a, got a clue. Oh, wait a minute, maybe this isn't just for the Jews. Wonderful counselor. He has sent his spirit to teach us, to give us counsel. Why? Because they're all one. God gives us counsel. Jesus Christ has given us counsel. His Holy Spirit continues to give us counsel. His Holy Spirit living inside of us. That still small voice that says, yeah, yeah, don't do that. Oh, I'm going to do it. Don't do that. You'll regret it. I think I'm going to do it. You really probably shouldn't. I told you not to do that. See, listen to me. Dang it, I should have listened to you. Okay? Have you ever read a passage of scripture and you just don't get it? You just don't get it. And then something happens one day and you read that passage and all of a sudden the light bulb goes on and there's understanding. See, that's God's spirit living inside of you, bringing to you awareness what you need at the time you need it. Okay? And I, I want to encourage you. The more you spend time walking according to his spirit, the more this becomes alive to you. The more it becomes understandable to you. Okay? So wonderful counselor. Then we move on. It says mighty God. Now this is really kind of a cool thing because going back to the Hebrew, there's, there's two things that are being said here that are almost identical. Okay? Mighty, well, that's powerful. A warrior, champion, chief. What's interesting, though, is it's used, these next three terms are used always in reference to man. Giant, mighty, strong. Those are always, when this word is used in the Hebrew, it's always referencing an attribute of man. Okay? But well, how, how does this work? Because it says, mighty God. Well, you just said it always references man. Yeah, it does. Because this is referencing the incarnation. Okay? God. Does anybody know what the word for God being used here is? No. Nope. Just L. L. And, and actually, it's kind of a generic term for God. As a matter of fact, it can even be used to describe idols. But what's interesting is that word carries with it the idea of strength. It's also used to describe someone who is mighty, specifically the almighty. Okay, so what we're seeing laid here, juxtaposition side by side, is mighty, specifically referencing man, and mighty, specifically referencing God. Do you see that? Those words were specifically chosen, I believe, to reveal the coming incarnation. Mighty, the Hebrew word referencing man. Mighty, L, referencing God. The Almighty. Do you see that? The more you dig into God's word, the more treasure you find. You will not be disappointed if you dig deep into God's word. All right? So, Almighty God. This is 
talking about Jesus. Now, and now think about this for a minute. Think about the life he led walking on this earth. Did he look like mighty God walking on this earth with his, his first coming? <coughs> I mean, he was humble. He was gentle. He was meek. He was born. Think about this. This is the, the creator of the universe. And he's not born in a palace. He's not born to a king or an emperor or, or even in some lordly fashion. He's born to a carpenter. Now, no offense to carpenters. Quite honestly, I think that's an incredible honor given to carpenters. But he wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't even born in a cool city. I mean, think about it. Rome had control of the known world at that time. He wasn't born in Rome. He wasn't even born in Jerusalem, the city of the great king. He was born in Bethlehem. What? what? Now, we know Bethlehem because we sing the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. But it's bad enough he's born in Podunksville. But he doesn't even get to be born in a cool place. He's born and put in a manger. Now, think about that for a moment. It was probably filled with clean straw and it was probably, well, maybe probably didn't mind too much. I don't know how the ox and the sheep felt about him being in there, but he probably didn't mind too much. But think about Almighty God, the creator of the universe, being born in one of the meekest and lowliest places you can think of. Doesn't really seem like mighty God, does it? But what was the reason for that? Well, I'll go back to Philippians 2. Read out Philippians 2. When Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but instead took upon himself the nature of a man, even the nature of a servant, and humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. Okay? What was mighty about that is God used something from a lowly position to accomplish his divine and eternal wills. He didn't need a king in that moment. He needed a perfect, spotless lamb. He didn't need the Lion of the tribe of Judah at that moment because if he'd come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah at that moment, we'd all be dead. There would have been no hope for us. Now, he's coming that way. That's our great hope that we are holding on to is that he will return as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is coming to reward his own. Do you think what you're getting for Christmas is cool? Wait till you see what he's got for you. So, mighty God. I think this is a, a description of the second incarnate, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? Where we will see him when he sets foot on the earth and by the word of his mouth he slays all of his enemies. And all the kings of the earth that are standing up against him cannot stand up against him? I mean, think about this. What army do you know gathers together and follows their leader in battle and watches their leader wipe out the enemy? And all we got to do is cheer them on. That's, that's, that's our role. To sing his praises and honor. This is the mighty God that is coming. Everlasting Father. Now think about this for a minute. Let's back up and look at the start of this. For unto us is given a child. But he will be called Everlasting Father. <coughs> without beginning, without end. Everlasting. See, this is another reason why Jesus could not have been created because he always was and always will be. Um, Isaiah 57 says, 
Uh, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity. Wow. You guys know how long eternity is? I mean, it's a simple answer, no, you don't. Unless you're sitting in the waiting room, waiting for your baby to be born. <laughs> then you know kind of what eternity feels like. Job 36 says, Behold, God is great, and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. We can't even find them because they're so great. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, all of these are specifically referring to the Father, but understanding that we believe in a triune God, because they refer to the Father, they also have to, by implication, refer to Jesus. Right? Well, there's, there's one here that makes it pretty clear. Revelation 22. Jesus is speaking and he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, keeping in mind, this is for our purpose, not his. Because he doesn't have a beginning, nor does he have an end. This is for our understanding, because we're finite. we got little brains, we got little scopes of vision. We have beginnings and ends, right? Okay. We were created. There will come a time when we will be ending here in this form, whether it be through death or his coming back, and we'll be changed in a moment. Okay? So, everlasting Father. Now, I love this term because the word for Father used here, it's not Abba, which is, is kind of carries it more of the idea of Daddy. This is Ah, which, which is Dad. This is, this is my Dad. Okay? Now, I love this because there's no way to confuse this with something else. There's no way to minimize this. God is telling us, I am going to send to you a son who will be your father forever. Forever. Without end. You're never going to outgrow him. Everlasting, God does not experience time. You guys understand God doesn't experience time the way we do because he kind of created it. You know, it's like um, I could make a watch, but the watch has no control over me, right? Well, actually, I can't make a watch. I can barely get the stupid thing on my wrist. But I, it has no control over me except for what I allow it. I'm late. I'm late. <coughs> God created time. He exists outside of time, but he, always, he sees all of time all at once. That's what being omnipresent means. Okay? He is everywhere all the time. So he sees what I said last week, right now. And he sees what I'm going to say next week, right now. This should give you incredible, incredible hope and peace and confidence in God because nothing ever surprises him. Ever. He already knows everything there is to know about anything. And he is going to be there. He promises to be with you in every moment. And he's already said that he is a wonderful counselor He's already described himself as the <coughs> mighty God, and he is everlasting Father. How did Jesus describe fathers? I mean, he looked at, at the fathers around him and said, you know, hey, if, if your child asks for a fish, which of you would give him a snake? I know some fathers that would have done that. <laughs> Shame on them. Or if he asks for an egg, you give him a stone. Well, he says, hey, if you, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, okay, if you being stupid know how to give good things to your kids, 
Our Father in Heaven, who is not stupid, knows how to give better things. Right? Amen. So, the first thing that we have to do when looking at this everlasting Father, the first thing that I had to do, I have to divorce from my brain my picture of what a father is. Okay? Because my dad had a lot of failures. Me as a father, I have a lot of failures. God has zero failures. He is the perfect father. Everything that we as men, as fathers, should ascribe to be. Women, you got it tough. You look at Proverbs 31, you got it tough. That's the model that God has laid out for you. The model God has laid out for us is Him. Now men, that's not to send you to despair because God equips those He calls. That's the whole process of maturity. We stumble, we fall, He picks us up, stands us on our feet, we learn our lesson, we move forward. Or we don't learn our lesson, we fall back down, He picks us back up. We don't learn our lesson again, we fall down, He picks us back up. Like I said last week, He is the master of the retest. Okay? So everlasting Father. Second Peter 3.8 says that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. He sees it all, all the time. James McDonald, I was listening to a message of his earlier, and he said, um, quoting John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, we understand that this is a salvation <coughs> passage, meaning that there is one way to heaven. There is only one way to heaven. It's only through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to get there. Every other way puts you before the righteous judgment of an offended God. And without the mercy that comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, there is no way to appease him. None. Okay? So only through Jesus Christ can a person be saved. But... James McDonald made a good point in his message. He said, this could be taken to mean that no one can understand the Father except through understanding the Son. Now this is kind of the core of what I want to tell you today. All right? No person has ever seen the Father. You can't see the Father. Scripture tells us you can't see him. Okay. Well, what about, you know, in the vision, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Abraham, what about all these guys? That went, well, I, I don't think they saw the Father. I think they saw pre-incarnate Christ. But when Jesus Christ came, he came to show us what we could not see. Because... Colossians 1.15 says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Hebrews 1.3 says he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Speaking with uh, the disciples, Jesus says in John 10.30, he says, I and the Father are one. <clears throat> And then a couple chapters over in John 14, he's speaking with Philip, and he says, Have I been with you so long and you still don't know? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. If you see Jesus, you've seen the Father. Now see, that's why this is so incredible. Not just for the cross, but the life itself is incredible because everything that Jesus is and was is the Father. Think about the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Was he compassionate? Was he compassionate? Was he merciful? Was he gracious? Was he loving? 
Was he kind? Was he just? Was he angry? You betcha. You betcha. But all of these things, God has placed before us that we might know Him. Every part of this, every part of His life, you want to know the Father, get to know the Son. The two are one. I and the Father are one. Look at the life of Jesus Christ. Look at the things He did. Look at the things He said. Look at His heart. Look at the story of, of the, the woman caught in adultery. Look at that story. Because the, the leaders, the religious leaders, man, they're rushing her up there, man. They're putting Jesus to the test. We caught this woman doing the dirty. According to the law, we should stone her. What do you say? Bro, I love what Jesus said. He didn't say anything. He just started writing in the dirt. Then he stood up and he said, well, you know, if anyone here is perfect, go ahead. Well, imagine the conversation between the Pharisees. Well, I know you're not perfect. We were just talking about what you did. I know you're not perfect because you told me about fishing and I know there was no fish that big. Liar. <laughs> and then he sits down and he, he writes some more in the dirt and he, quite honestly I, I think he was writing their sins just as a reminder I think he was saying fishermen lie and he put the date and that dude placed his rock carefully on the ground and found something better to do than challenge the creator of the universe to a conversation about the law that he implemented So we see how he dealt with those who were trying to manipulate the law and trying to manipulate God. But then, but then he doesn't stop there, does he? Because this woman who was caught in sin, she was not innocent. She was not innocent. How does he treat with her? This woman, where are your accusers? They're gone. They went fishing, I guess. He says, well, I, I don't accuse you either. But, but he didn't stop there. What did he tell her? Go. Quit doing this. You're ruining your life. Go. Don't do this anymore. See, he's perfectly just. Don't sin. But he's full of mercy. I am not accusing you. Here's your chance. And God lays that self-same chance before us every day. Through the cross, we can come before Him having been caught in our sins. Okay? We come to the God who sees everything, who divines the intent of the heart. He knows what's going on in here. You go, well, I never did that sin. You thought about it. You did it. <coughs> but, you know, well, there's no buts because God's perfect. God requires perfection. He says, be perfect as I am perfect. I can't. You're right. You can't. That's why that's so important. Because where your sin abounds, and some of us, we got sin that is abounding. We have bountiful sin. His grace does much more abound. You look at the depth and the magnitude of your sin and His grace completely overwhelms it. This is what mighty God is all about. But then that last phrase, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. I, th I think that's a twofold prophecy. I think it's twofold. Because I think for the believers, he is our Prince of Peace. 
We talked a couple weeks ago about the fruit of the Spirit, peace. And how peace is not having conflict in your life. Now, that's not what it is. It's not just an absence of conflict. Uh, I, I showed you what I believe to be the perfect example of peace. Is Jesus asleep in the boat when the storm is raging all around him? He wasn't worried. He was okay. He had no problem with what was going on. There was chaos going around him. I mean, they thought they were going to die. But he had peace. And he says, that's the peace I give you. My peace. The peace that in the midst of the storm, I'm not worried. I'm not stressed. I'm not anxious. Why? Because he knows the Father's heart. Well, we know the Father's heart. He says that his plans for you are good. Right? He doesn't say you're not going to go through a storm. He says, my heart toward you is good. I have good plans for you. Well, some of the things I've been through this year, I didn't think were too good. I didn't like them. I didn't like having my son fall on my leg and hear it go crack. I didn't like that. I still don't like that. I hear that sometimes and just go. <laughs> I didn't like sitting in the doctor's office and telling them, you got a potentially fatal heart condition. I just, well, what? But God brought me through. And even if it was a fatal heart condition and he took me home, boy, did he bring me through. Wow. Because his heart toward me is good. His heart toward you is good. Prince of Peace. So as believers, we have access to the very peace of Christ. The world doesn't understand it. The world can't give it. It only comes through him. And it comes through him how? By taking all the garbage that we have in this life and turning around and handing it right off to him. Things come on me and I... I I told you before, I sometimes I have to picture it. I have to picture taking a shovel and a steaming pile of poo <laughs> and just shoveling it right over to him saying, God, I can't deal with this. I, I have no strength to deal with this. Please take this from me. But his word promises me he is not going to put on me more than I can bear. Well, what do I have to worry about? He's, I'm yoked with him and he's carrying the weight of the universe. And he will always provide a way out that I could endure. That's his promise to me. God, this feels really hard. Well, you're not supposed to be holding on to that. You're supposed to give that to me. But God, it's really heavy, so give it to me. God, it's, I, it's hard. It's heavy. I don't, I don't know what to do with it. Give me the burden. Oh, yeah. And sometimes, sometimes I just got to say, God, can you take it? Because I can't even let go of it at this point. And he's always faithful. But I, I have to tell you, sometimes I have to do it over and over and over and over and over again. It's like I, I've got a yo-yo burden. I throw it out and I bring it back. And I throw it out and I bring it back. And I have to keep, God is so faithful. Pass the burden to me. Give it up, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. God, it's so heavy. Yeah, I know. Give it to me. I'm teaching you in this. I'm building in you the character that I need. I'm bringing you to maturity that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. God, I, I kind of want to just stay in my diaper. No, 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 son. You got to grow up. At 46 years old, you got to get out of a diaper, buddy. Grow up. Okay, but could you make it easy for me? There are no spiritual fatties in the kingdom of God. Did you know that? God requires our spirits to be strong, to be mighty. So Prince of Peace. So right now, he is our Prince of Peace. But there is coming a day when he will establish his rule forever on this earth. He will establish it, and he will reign in peace for eternity. It's a twofold prophecy. Right now, he is not the Prince of Peace to the people that have rejected him. Their lives are in chaos. 
They're in turmoil. They're in. They're lost. He could be if they would accept him. But right now they they they're lost. But one day it, it, it will be for everyone. Now don't don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying love wins. I'm not a universalist because there will come a day everybody's going to be presented with an opportunity to know him in, in some measure or another. Don't let's not get into philosophical and theological arguments. I am convinced that at some day everybody will stand before him, everybody will kneel, everybody will acknowledge him as Lord. Some will do it to his glory saying, thank you God, Jesus is Lord. We praise you, we honor you, we glorify you, we love you. And some people will say, you're Lord but we hate you. We despise your mastery over us. Because it says, throw them into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth is not because of agony. Gnashing of teeth is because of something you hate. Look it up in scripture. Every time they gnashed their teeth, it was because they were railing against something. Prince of Peace. So here we have A description of who Jesus Christ is. He's a baby. He's a son. Let's read this just one more time. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called. Now, one thing I didn't say. Your name is something that uniquely identifies you. Now, there are other people that might have your name. We've got several Daves and Davids in here. Actually, I only see one here today. But we have the people might share your name. But, but that's how we identify each other, right? Sometimes we have nicknames. I won't tell you what my father's nickname was for me because we're recording this. <laughs> Ask me later. His nickname for my sister was Pumpkin Butt. <laughs> Him, not me. Uh, I'm not going to say that. Mine was a little bit worse. <laughs> His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So as we celebrate the coming of the Messiah, the first advent of Jesus Christ, the birth of that baby who is at one and the same time an infant born in human flesh and almighty God. We need to remember how God describes him. He describes him wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, Father, for your word, so rich, so abundant. Father, we can never survey the depths without finding new things because, Father, you are infinite and you have created and crafted your world so masterfully. Help us, Father, to be students of your word, to be, as David said, to love your word, to be passionate in our pursuit of understanding of your word. Father, that we would be as the wise and not as fools, that we wouldn't just glance at it and then walk away and forget it. But Father, we would study it intently that we might know you. Father, I ask your blessing on this fellowship here today, this family, this body of believers, God. You have called us all here. Even in this moment, you have called us all here with purpose. I'm asking God that you would reveal your purpose to each person here. 
Father, for those that may not know you, I ask a revelation of you in such a way that, Father, their, their, their hearts will just be open to you. Father, overwhelm intellect. Overwhelm insecurity. Overwhelm, Father, hurts that life has given. I ask, God, that those who may not know you would just pour out their hearts to you today and become known by you in eternity, that you would mark them with your spirit and you would give to them the right to call you Father, that they would be your children. And Father, for those that know you today, I ask, Lord God, that you would be our Prince of Peace, that you would be our mighty God, our wonderful Counselor, because you are our everlasting Father. Safeguard us, Father. Safeguard our hearts and our minds in you, that as the enemy seeks to come and destroy we would stand firm because we know whose we are. As the world would come in and tell us lies and seek to deceive us and try and present to us false knowledge, God, that we would know who you are. Now, Father, as our flesh rises up and seeks to live the way that we lived before you came into our lives, Father, we would reject it. We would put it back on the cross where it belongs and we would walk according to your spirit. Father, that we might bring honor and glory to your name. We thank you, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.